still can't hear the intro. All right, everybody, we are live and ready to roll, so to speak, with the Sports Minion Radio Show. I'm your host, DJ D to the J with a roll away, and over here to my side is the Lord of the Lunatics, Big Chuck. How's it going, brother? Love me. Always love him. That's the way the cookie crumbles. And I don't the, crumble cookies. Uh, stuff. I'm sure you do. All right, got a couple of uh, quick events to go over really fast here. Want to just run these by you. Uh, we've got uh, the Kelly's Choice Cares uh, anniversary coming up on uh, July the 14th. Uh, it's from 4 to 7. That's going to be at uh, the radio station, 6212 Jefferson Avenue in Newport News, Virginia. Uh, so we're going to have that on the 14th from 4 to 7. We have the annual Caregivers Gala coming up, formal attire for that. That's going to be on November 16th, and that's going to be at the 757 Hub. That's at 6801 Bridgeway Drive in Suffolk. That I'll is be looking fly for that. All going to be looking pretty fly. And I'm not going to finish the other one there. <laughs> we'll just go with it. <laughs> so make sure that y'all come and support uh, Kelly's Choice and the, gear, uh, the Gala Ball formal attire. So look good, dress shoes, and suit be all that you can be at the care, Caregiver's Gala. Is and, is a leisure suit considered formal? You know, I, I, don't, I don't know. I was going to wear my cane and my feather hat, but I guess well, look, that, that ain't going to work either. I can, I can powder my hand. <laughs> I, I don't know how, how the walk would look with, with my, hand. my pimp hand is strong. Uh, okay, now. I'm, all right, all right. Well, I, I got the hat and I got the feather. I just don't know if I can get it. You can't get Or you can lean. <laughs> right it on over. I can lean. Right? <laughs> hey, Elizabeth, thank you for joining the Sports Menu Radio Show. Listen, gonna going to put the number out there early. We're going to have a lot of topics to talk about today. If you want to call in and tell me how much you love me. Or just to call in and tell him, please wear his pimp hat, uh, 757-774-7552. We've got another um, event for uh, Kelly's Choice Cares, uh, and that's going to be the business meeting that's going to hit actually the 29th of this month, and that's also going to be at the uh, Newport News location for the radio station. So we've got a lot of things coming up, going to be excited about. Uh, got a really, really big karate tournament coming up. The Battle of the Seven Cities finally have all the information for that. They didn't invite me. You know, you're always invited. It's just you have to have the ten bucks to get in. But you're my I'm brother. Gonna, I'm gonna. I mean, they might need a whoop butt. Well, you, you know, if they did that, they really wouldn't have a tournament. And I don't want to fight my brother and watch you kill me and then look up. You, you have to watch me I, from the floor. I, I know. That's why I said look up. But there we go. Battle of the Seven Cities. Uh, the this will be. The ninth one that I'm actually competing in, but we're really excited. A new location this year going to be at St. Patrick's Catholic School, 1000 Bowling Avenue, Norfolk, Virginia, 23508. Uh, $70 for one or three events, and it's also going to be the $10 spectator fee for that. Uh, children five and under get in free. And go heckling. Uh, I, <laughs> don't do Please heckling. don't. Heckling. No. You should pay you 10 bucks just to heckling. Oh, my great. You cannot. <laughs> Look. Go <man>. home, DJ. <laughs> Go home, DJ. You were, you were having way too much fun with that. <laughs> Let me just confirm everything here real quick. Uh, registration is from 8.30 to 10, 10 a.m. The Black Belt meeting will be at 10, and the competition starts at 10.30. Again, one or all events will be uh, sparring, weapons, Empty hand and forms, and we will have one or all seventy dollars. Spectator fee is ten dollars, and five and under are free. Now, let me real quick go over the prizes uh, for the winners uh, for men and women's kata grand championship will be four hundred dollars and a belt. Uh, for the um, is it WWE belt? Uh, no, it's a little bit better now. Uh, yeah, it's gonna be it's gonna be pretty good. Can uh, I beat you with it? Uh, now, now look, you can't just wait till after the tournament. Oh, All right. uh, uh, you got to got to wait a little bit. The uh, the forms and uh, empty hand uh, men and women's will be uh, uh, four hundred and a excuse me uh, three hundred and a belt. Uh, they will have um, the. 12 and under grand championship 
uh, for the underbelt for the bicycle. We'll have a brand new bicycle for the twelve and under. There's somebody underbelt uh, for underbelt considered under black belt. Oh, oh wow. there we go. I thought, they, I thought they were little people under belts. Well, if that's the case, I gotta find them. I don't want to roll them over. That's just bad. And then we've got bad the, form, sir. Uh, I, I'm sorry about your child, ma'am. It's stuck <laughs> on my wheel. I didn't mean to. So we've got 13 to 15 under uh, under belt as well, uh, bicycle brands. So a lot of things to do. They're gonna have concessions, all sorts of stuff, and. Go out and support the Battle of the Seven Cities. Go out and heckle DJ. Come on out. If you want to heckle me, heckle me. Try to throw me out of my chair. Let's see what happens. Don't take me up on that because I know you'll try. I won't yeah, just I, try. I, I, yeah, I know. <laughs> I know. But don't hurt you back, man. you got to work. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so that, that's the thing. you got to know about that. All right. So we got a couple of we'll, – we'll go over the events again, you know, kind of toward the end of the show for anybody that missed yeah. it. Uh, he just likes to hear himself talk about karate. No, I, I just like to hear myself talk, period. Well, you know, I know that's why, you, that's why we're doing this show. <laughs> All right, so just real quick, I want to go over Virginia, their their first NCAA title. I mean, I, I got to – what a game. Uh, you know, I looked at a lot of that, and especially in that fourth quarter, that the pass to Hunter to hit that outside three and draw two defenders to leave him wide open on the outside. 20 seconds to go, beautiful drain, came up. I mean, they drain, the, drain? Drain, drain the three. Drain oh, the three. There nothing we go. but net. Nothing but net. Hit it all. There it is right there. You know, all season, and the two games that they seemed to pull off miracles at were Purdue and Duke. I mean, and to come back and Look, win. That just messed. I, 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 I can't stand it. How come? Because I ruined my bracket. Oh, my goodness. It ruined your bracket. Well, I mean, I, I, I he, he's upset, guys. I gotta let him calm down. I mean, he, his head's steaming over here. I can't. I, I mean, I just, I've never seen you know two miracle games to where it, it just. I had no, especially with Duke. That one threw me for a loop because that came down to the last second, and I, I knew it was possible. I've just never seen it. I mean, I mean, aside from, well, from we've had some Cinderellas. I mean. You know, some small schools make some upsets, but never, at, never at the final. But but you look at you know Virginia last year being eliminated in the first round, and and, and it was it was done. I mean, and that's obviously that's what happens when you get eliminated. But yeah, I mean, elimination kind of means it's done. It, I mean, what was the, what do you think the big change was just in 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 the play? I mean, because the coach seemed to they 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 were calm the entire time. They never lost their composure because they've been there before. They've been in the tournament. They've got some experience now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, players actually have, you know, been in a tournament before. Mm -hmm. So it weren't quite as, you know, one of the things about, you know, tournaments is that first time you get to go. Right. It really, you know, it's kind of nerve wracking. Mm -hmm. You know, so now a lot of these guys, the junior, the sophomores, juniors, and seniors have been there before. I mean, is it is it easier the second time around? Or it's less nerve, less less I don't nerve. Think it's easier, easier or harder. It's just you know you you don't make, tend to make as many dumb mistakes from nerves. And, and I mean, is that just a lot of that is 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 overhyped? Just trying to get you know everything everything well, going. Everybody, you know, you get into that tournament for the first time and you go, man, you know, I got to play perfect. Yeah, yeah. And then you try so hard to play perfect. And then you make one mistake, and then your nerves set in, and then they make it two mistakes. Yeah, and it snowballs and it to, starts to compile. And the next thing you know, mm -hmm. you're eliminated mm -hmm. in the first round. Because you know, and and what what got me is, you know, especially with you know from the from the three throw line out of uh, that that two point range, everything just seemed to fall. And even when it didn't, I mean, it was like they, they weren't they weren't rushing to try to, to try to, you know, make something happen. They took the they remote took control it, balls. Uh, yeah. 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 They, they took, that's, they were, it was, it, you need to start at the flight gate. Oh boy. The ball was inflated a 10th of a pound less severe. I, I can prove it. Here's the needle. Yeah. I, I, but no, I mean, they took advantage of the opportunity and, and uh, you know, congratulations to them. Good for them for ruining that bracket. I, I mean, but there's always next year. You know, there's that, always next year. No, somebody else will ruin my bracket. I, I tell you, I tell you, it's just, it's just amazing to me how upset. how how they ruined my bracket. <laughs> how upset you are! Look, it's a five hundred dollar bracket. I, I I know. 
Uh, well, I didn't know, but now I know, and yeah. knowing is half the battle. All right, DJ, if I was going to give you five hundred dollars if if your bracket was right and you lost it because of Virginia, would you be upset? Well, yeah. All right, yeah, thank you. I mean, five hundred bucks is five hundred bucks. Exactly. Um, but no, I don't gamble. <laughs> All right. So I, I, I mean, I want. So now going into to next year, does this put a target on their back automatically? Because they're they're champions. It depends on how many of their seniors and juniors are still there. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, one of the things one of the things with like Duke and some of these other schools that you know consistently get into the Final Four, Top Eight, right, is because they keep, they constantly have guys replacing the ones that are losing to the NBA. Right. right. Um, Virginia probably won't have a whole squad of guys. That can replace them if, if they've got you know four of their starters leaving. Right. So so what do they do in in, in that case? I mean, they to, to lose in the first round next year. <laughs> wow. I mean, uh, it's just, you know, it's just how it is. I mean, are they are they pulling from other colleges to try to to no to you, make up from the recruiting class comes from you know where you're recruiting. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, so if you've got it, now this helps the future recruiting class, because now they can say we have an NCAA title. Right. You right. Know, we won last year. You want to come here. We're the bomb. Right. Right. You know, that's one of the reasons Duke and some of the, you know, some of these top schools get, get are constantly having people because they say, you know, we got Coach K. Mm-hmm. You mm-hmm. know, we exactly. got, right. we got X amount of titles. Well, and, and I mean, looking at, you know, you, you're talking about, you know, players going to the NBA, Williams, Hunter, you know, the guys that are there. How much of this now puts pressure on the players that are leaving to perform well because, you know, you're playing for the big money, you're playing for the big contract? Well, now, I mean, they have to play two years now before they can before they can go in the NBA. Mm-hmm. So they can't leave before their junior year. Right, and that's the new rule that was instituted. Yeah, I came a few, couple few years ago. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I think, you know, some of the, like, you know, Kobe and them are the last 18-year-olds. <laughs> right. You know, they came in, you know, mm-hmm. LeBron. Mm-hmm. But yeah, so they got to play the two years, or they've got to go to a like subsequent league, like the European league, right? Or down the African league before, yeah, yeah. Um, and so they got to play there for a couple of years before they can go into the NBA. Now, talking about next year, if if they don't come out and do well, I mean, I mean, they probably won't. Yeah, it's gonna hurt them. No, I but, mean, they're not. I mean, Virginia is a is a good basketball school, you know. They tend to do okay, mm-hmm. you know. They always have, yeah. Right. But mm-hmm. so, they, I mean, this is the first time they've done great. Right, right. You know, and took the title. So, it'll help them. But the, I think, you know, even if making the top 64 teams in basketball, mm-hmm. you know, in the NCAA, mm-hmm. not, you know, not the little – but if you're in the top 64, if you're going to the – you know, making the top 64 – you you get you're getting a pretty good recruiting class. I mean, you're you're looking at their record and pulling that up with sixty four and four. That's that's almost unheard. Of. I mean, I mean, no. to to run like that. No, Duke Duke's done better. Yeah, Syracuse done better. North Carolina's done better. But I mean, as far as so now, is it added pressure now? Uh, again, it depends. You know, if they've got. They're starting five coming back yeah, again. Yeah, yeah. They're probably not because those guys have won it now. They they're so if they make it next year. They know you know they know mm-hmm. what they got to do. Mm-hmm. If they've got five you know five new starters because everybody's gone, then yeah, that's a huge pressure. Now with with the longer you know basketball season, does it take longer to gel in the you know situation of bringing in college? The, no. the, the how come? Because they've got you know unlike the NBA. You know, these guys are practicing in the off season. They're, you know, they're recruited and brought in. They do, they do all sorts of, you know, team stuff. You know, at that point, they're not paid prima donnas. Mm, yeah. You know. And, and they're – and now, again, just correct me if I'm wrong on this. There is there a cap in basketball? So I know there's not one There in is a soft cap in basketball. All right. Now, there's a way to play – don't ask me to explain it because a soft cap means that they can manipulate certain things. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a max and a minimum that it can make, and you know they can manipulate things and do all sorts of weird things. 
I mean, it's not like at, at the NFL cap where this, you have X amount of dollars. Mm -hmm. You know, you can pay X up to X amount. And you and can't bonuses, go over that. And you can't go over this. Do you realize how hard my brain has to work not to ask you to explain it? Because I couldn't. I'm going to tell you what. Unless you are a an accountant, mm -hmm. I don't know that you can actually explain <laughs> the basketball, you know. You have to. You have to know. I mean, there's so many little things that they do to Blue manipulate poles. the mm -hmm. system, yeah, yeah, so that they can pay these guys and get the big, you know, the big big guy, you know, make these super teams. Are there are there advantages to having the soft cap versus the hard cap to where you can't go over the specific amount? I think, and this is just my opinion, the hard cap forces teams to be a little more. Diverse. Um, I think the NFL has done a good job of getting – there are no real – I mean, other than the Cleveland Browns, who just made some stupid mistakes up until this year. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's a few teams that just, for some reason, can't, you know, do anything to get anything right. But it, it pretty much – you have the ability to build a good team in the NFL. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. NBA, the smaller markets suffer in the soft cap because – they can't afford to pay to make the super teams. Right, right. You know, your Milwaukee Bucks, they can only stay good for so long because, you know, they can't afford to pay these guys back. So it runs dry pretty quick. I mean, runs dry pretty quick. Right. So, mm -hmm. you know, those guys are going to – unless they're willing to work with the team, then they're going to end up somewhere else, you know, in the in Boston or L.A. or, you know, some of the bigger market teams. You know, I, I guess my big question for the NBA and looking at college – you know, you, you say one player can't make a difference, but it really can. In I mean, the NBA, yes, I mean, because you only got five on the on the court. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, um, and it you know LeBron makes a huge difference, right? Right on the court, and, and you know for for him, it, even even reading the stories on him, it's it, he it, there's a difference automatically when he's in the game, not just. The intimidation factor, but someone that knows the game and can play on on all fronts of it, defensively and offensively. Yeah, um, but even with LeBron, you have to have one or two other guys that can shoot. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, because LeBron, you know, if he has even the slightest off day, and you feed him the ball, look at Derrick Rose. Um, you know where he just. He'll shoot and shoot and shoot and shoot, mm -hmm, you mm -hmm. know, 35%, well, mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. and shoot a million times. Right. And, you know, and you're not going to win Brown. that way. Yeah, yeah. You know, you've got to have other people. That's why they did so well with when Love was with him over in Cleveland. That's mm -hmm. why they won that championship mm -hmm. is because – Share the wealth kind they, of thing. You know, you've yeah. got other people to worry about. Yeah. You can't just worry about LeBron James. Well, I mean, you, you, you look at, you know, back in the day with Chicago when you had Pippen and Jordan and Kukoc and Grant and, and – to, to really, you know, move the ball around. You had your superstar. Right, right. And Jordan. And you had role players around him. Pippen, Cucho, all these guys. You know, mm. Daddy V, Daddy V, v -Lock the flopper. Mm. Yeah. Um, Rodman. No, Rod, yeah, well, that was later. Well, he had colored hair, so we could just go with it. I mean, it, I it, mean, he was he was wearing drag then. <laughs> yeah. But, I, no, I'm a fan of Rodman. I thought he was one of the best defensive players of all time. I, the amount of rebounds that he could get in a game that man sick. That man when he when they were when they were the bad boys in the Detroit Pistons, mm -hmm. he was a rebound machine. Well, I mean, you look at even even Barkley and Hewing and, and the, the guys that really made this uh the solid impact on the game that that could do it all. I mean even Bugs at what five three a Bugs at five three five six come on I mean he was a passing machine no but, he was a shooting machine but <clears throat> but also could shoot the ball as you said quite yes. well and and didn't have the height of your six one six two six three guys. but you're taking away from some of the three point guys too you know there are some guys Miller mm hmm mm hmm. Um, I mean, my favorite, Larry Bird. Yeah. Now that, now that, now man. I'm a fan of old school Detroit Pistons. You know, mm -hmm. uh, Celtics defensive. You know, punch somebody in the face, elbow everywhere. 
you know, defensive games that, you know, end up 70 to 70 to 80. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I like that kind of stuff. Well, and, and the, the game itself has changed. The oh, that was just score. Yeah. The There's not much defense. The aggressiveness has, has changed. I know. have never watched the game, you know, back in the day where, you know, you got 116 to 113 in. Yeah. And, and in yeah. regular play. Not, and we're not talking yeah. about overtime. Yeah. Yeah. At the end of regulation, yeah. it's so close that you're going. Well, not even so close. I'm you. I you know back in the day, even when Jordan was playing, mm-hmm. you know there were if you had a team that had over 110 points, exactly. they ran away with it. Exactly, and and that was it. You yeah. know you couldn't. But now you got a 30 point deficit, and that's nothing. They come back from it like it. Now they just run back and forth and score. Yeah, and yeah. and I think whoever can score the most. I think that's where the conditioning part is 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 so so different because you're moving all no, the time. They moved more than back in the day. Really? Yes. Defense. They play defense. Wow. Now this it was constant motion. Go watch a Larry Bird Magic Johnson game. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the guys diving for the ball, mm-hmm. you know, fighting over it. There was absolutely no stop. And it and fouling quite a bit more. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But now <laughs> these sissies. Oh. You know, they oh. they stub a toe and they they're out oh, for a minute. Oh, month. it's over! It's over! Uh, you I'm know. broken now. It's over. They're not all of them. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> not all of them. So so the game has lost some of its toughness. It's all about, it's all about scoring. Yeah. Now. yeah. Just like in baseball, you know, how many times do you hear people complain when it's a one nothing game? Oh my gosh! Can you can I tell you what a good segue that was? Because I mean that was. <laughs> Man, right on, right on the twenty-minute mark, he pulled it. Do you not understand <laughs> that that one-nothing game is a strategic, oh. hard-played game? Those pitchers are working it. That Sweet. catcher is smart. Mm-hmm. They have played oh. the field great. That, Stop crying about a one-nothing game. That was uh, matter of fact. Three days ago, Matt Scherzer pitched uh, seven and a third. And it was one nothing. And he goes out, and then the bullpen couldn't get it done, and they ended up losing. The Nationals ended up losing three to two. Okay, that's still three to two is a low score. Yeah, game that, it, is. it is. That's it is. that's a defensive strategy based baseball game. Guys, again, please call in. We're live on LetGoRadio.net seven five seven 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 four seven five five two. Come talk to the sports minions. This is a great. Tell time. me how right I am. I, Good lord, I, I have to tell you. That with especially with baseball and, and the game I watched the entire game yesterday, the uh, Nationals in Philly. I'm gonna tell you when I saw when that game first started, the Nationals were down six to one. I mean, uh, Strasburg couldn't throw a cow and and and, and watch it move. The, the term yeah. is couldn't hit the broad side of the bar. I, yeah, I was. I thank you. I, You're welcome. But I mean, it no location. I mean, outside the uh, zone. Do and, we? And here's the thing. Okay, number one, Strasburg is not a – he is a corner, work the piece side. Yep, inside, inside, yep. So, if you have an ump that's not giving it to him, he has to struggle. Yeah. Those yeah. Guys, the guys that aren't just power pitchers and mm-hmm. you right know, down the middle. Yeah. Not necessarily right down – nobody – right down the middle is or, not the place to or, throw or, it for or low, Let's say low in the zone. Yeah. You know that work the zone, but yeah. don't but yeah. don't have to pick the corners. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, if you've got an ump that's being stingy, as long as he's doing it fairly on both sides, that's it, one, that's yeah. fine. Yeah. But it hurts those pitchers. It does. You it know, does. even back in the day, the Greg Maddoxes, so the guys that work the you know work the, pe- the the plate. You know, those guys struggle when when the ump is tough. You know, I, I looked at. Let me. I'm just, I'm just kind of reviewing my notes here. That, like I said, they were about in the fourth inning. They were behind six to one. Uh, by the time that they pulled, uh, they pulled Strasburg out. And, and, and here's my question because this is what I was struggling with: when your pitcher is struggling and, and everybody is getting hits, because he had uh, two huge home runs, one by Harper for, for a three shot, and then uh, you know had another one by. Oh gosh, I can't think. It oh, doesn't matter. Um, it's fine. Just, but I mean, it, it was back to back. He was struggling in, again, that corner-to-corner, what you're talking about. He couldn't find his location. And Davey Martinez was, was sitting there. He wanted to pull him out, but he waited. We well, got to because I, it affects your bullpen. If and you, not it, only that, it affects it, the pitcher. Yeah, yeah. You know, 
there's times where a pitcher's struggling and all of a sudden he figures it out mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and turns it around, even at 6 nothing. Right, right. Well, and there's times he just lets it go and it just gets worse and worse. Sure, but sure. But if you pull him out at one and a third inning mm-hmm. because he's getting hammered, even mm-hmm. two or three innings, you just ruined your bullpen for the next – Sometimes a month. Welcome, Grandmaster Dark. Thank you for joining us on the Sportsman Radio Show. We appreciate it. Uh, you know, I, I look at one of my favorite players since the, the start of this year has been uh, Victor Robles. I was sitting there watching the game with, with Marshall, and it's a funny part. They had brought it back to within 6-4, and it was the seventh inning. You know, you won, I won out to get, and it went into the eighth because they had two men on and left them stranded. I said, oh, no. And Robles came up. I said, you know what? If he gets one over the outside, outside of the play, or right on the inside, he's going to smash it. And the next pitch, he took it. Why do you keep looking at me? The camera's out. I, I know. I, I do that. But it's funny because when he carried it, that, that first shot to get it to 6-6, it was, it was, you know, you knew something was happening. And, and, it, and it carries over the momentum. Well, you know, nobody realizes how strategic pitchers, batters, and catchers are. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You know, every every batter has a cold and hot spot. Yeah, yeah. And, that, and it varies depending on the time of year, you know, what how he's hitting, how he's moving. The catcher has to know these. Mm-hmm. The pitcher has to know. Sure. You know, the catcher studies all this. And the hot, spot, the hot spot varies. That's what I just said. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Thanks, thanks for just repeating what I just uh, said. Sorry about that. Um, so the catcher studies all this and he's the one that calls it. And that's why you see him moving this stuff around. Yeah. You know, sometimes a batter likes it low and inside. Mm -hmm. Sometimes he likes it high and inside or outside, you know, wherever they like it, that's where they want to keep it away. Exactly. Because that's where the batter's going to hit it the best. And if a pit, and if the pitcher's on and he's got good control Mm -hmm. and he, and the, the catcher's good, he's done his homework, you get a pitch a pitching duel smartest smartest move Davey Martinez made and I and I really thought this was commendable because everybody said oh my god what is he doing <clears throat> he brought in Sean Doolittle at the at the uh, did I never brought him in just because of his name I, I love he he, he the, just does little the, the doctor was in Dr. Doolittle was in and the animals were talking because he struck out Harper with whiffs he started him he started him low. Harper, well, okay. Harper Chase. Harper's not hard to strike out. You know, a lot a lot of people say that, but he is a strikeout machine. <laughs> he is all or nothing. Mm-hmm. He home runs or strikes out. Yeah. There's not much in between. You know, he he's a great hitter, but it's a, it's a, he's kind of an all or nothing. You know, there's a lot of guys that are out there that are like that, and they're you know, I personally. Like the Ozzy Smith style batters mm-hmm. can can do you know, a little bit of everything. Well, well, gonna, he's going to put it where you know you can you can say, "Hey, I need you to move the runners," mm-hmm. <clears throat> and he's going to put it there. Make sure even if he doesn't get on, that he's moved them runners in the scoring position. But, you know, the, my my very next point, and, and coming into you know, you talk about their strategic um, play of the game, where especially on the shift. Or it looks like there's a big hole up the middle. That's because the batter can't hit there. Yeah, and, and the funny part about it is how quickly that hole closes when a ball gets hit and, and the bounce that it takes from a grounder going up the middle, that space that they cover from the, – they're off a of second base by it looks like 200 feet, but they're really not, and the, and the ground closes so quick. One of the best DH hitters in all in, in ever is David Ortiz. Yep. And he comes up, and they shift big time. Mm-hmm. But every once in a while, he'll flop one over into that hole. Yep. Not very rare, but, I mean, you're more likely going to get him out. And, and you know, the, in, in that game that I saw in a lot of games this year, looking at the handle of the ball, getting the ball out of the glove on a hot shot or a hot grounder coming in, that's a lot harder than it looks because you're moving, trying to get over to first. It depends on – what handed you are and which way you're going. That's that's true too. Now um, you, you played baseball. Yes, I played uh, baseball all through high school, all the way up. Yeah. Oh, I, I couldn't hit. What did you What did you play? Uh, I played shortstop and second base. Second. I, I could play anywhere on the infield. 
don't put me on the outfield because I couldn't judge a ball in the outfield for the world. <laughs> now, the, 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 the first to second, is that the 90 feet or is that second to third? I think 90 feet is second to third, right? It's 90 feet from base to base. Ba either, either way. Because the reason I'm no, asking. No, it's, it's a little more from third to first. Okay. Okay. The reason I'm asking is because they talked about uh, uh, Deshaun Gomes coming in off the bench cold. And the, the DH hitter, just like you talked about, coming in first home run of the year, two run shot. And then Juan Soto comes up. And this one, I played the video of this thing, and it sounded like a cannon. When he hit the ball, you knew it was a homer. 435 feet over the foul pole, and, and you hear Bob and FP going, yep, it's going, going back, 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 back. It's going. And I went, oh, my God, because the ball, the exit velocity was 108 miles an hour. Well, that's not, that's not unusual. <sighs> I mean, you got 100, you know, you think it, if you've got a hard pitcher throwing 98 miles an yeah, hour, yeah. The, the likelihood of it coming off the bat, if it's a solid shot, is anywhere from 106 to 112 miles an hour. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Can you imagine trying to catch that? Um, no, I would be very scared because when I see it, I would jump out of my chair even if I could. As a pitcher, you know, there if it's back at your face, mm -hmm. it, you have absolutely no time. Right. <laughs> it is pure reaction to get your glove up. Yep. And um, in the hope and a prayer. <laughs> I, I can I can tell you one of the my favorite things to watch in the game and and the batters are so smart now is I'm, two more comments on baseball we'll move on because why not we're talking about baseball all we want no I, I you know I Who like cares? It. I, I like it it's fun but the check swing you know with it with it with a batter being able to check swing and it looks like a strike until the very last instant especially on a slider with good movement that goes down into the dirt. But you see them go tr – they're trying to get the ball up because the ball is down. If you hit the ball down, you're going to ground it. But if you can get up under it, which is a lot of, a lot of players well, are trying to do – It's not necessarily under it because getting under it, you're putting it up. Oh, so are you trying to get on top You're of trying it to then? get level. Yeah. You, you, yeah. Want, you want to be level. Well, so I, I want to be level that. either way, but that's not going to happen. When you're swinging, you're trying to hit the sweet spot of the bat. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. And you're trying to hit it level, yeah, yeah, because that's going to put you for a bait, most likely a base hit. If you if you're if you're hitting it in a sweet spot, you're hitting it level, and you know where you're, you know how fast you're swinging versus what you're pitched at. Mm -hmm. You know mm -hmm. you can pretty much put it anywhere you want. Yep, yep. And I and I and I I believe, but I'll I'll go on record as saying this right now with with um, Victor Robles batting batting in the ninth spot is so smart. I think that he's a great hitter. I think he's a he's a great. Uh, what's his what's his batting average? Oh what's gosh, what is he? He's like uh, two eighty, almost three hundred. That's not actually bad. I, I mean, like, so, I mean, he's he's running, and, and 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 like you talked about, how is your pitcher not your ninth spot? Well, I you sure he's not hitting eighth? I, I'm sorry, eighth. He's eighth because yeah, he's the, your second clean right. I mean, which is and and it's just he just seems to know. You know, you talk about smart baseball. He just seems to know where to put it. He doesn't try to kill it all the time. If anybody, and, and I'm here, I'm going to talk about Boston again. Mm -hmm. But because you know, because I watch a lot of Boston. Mm -hmm. The one reason Boston has been successful mm -hmm. over the last ten years is because ninety percent of their batters work the count. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, they, they don't have a lot of free swingers. Exactly. Exactly. You know, they make the pitcher work. They and may strike out. Count up. They mm -hmm. may ground out. Mm -hmm. They may pop up. Mm -hmm. But you're going to take five, six, seven pitches every batter. Yep. And that, that works that pitch count by the fourth inning. You're in 50, 60 pitches. Sometimes I've seen them up in the 80s yeah. by that point. And the score still nothing, nothing. Yeah, that's what concerned me about Strasburg because he was struggling so much. By the fourth inning, he had thrown 65 pitches. I mean, that's – to me, that seems like it's a lot. I mean, just no, – Nolan Ryan used to throw 160 pitches a game. Now, there, there's a good question to ask. And speaking of questions, I promise I will get to those questions that I that I got last week. I, I promised you guys that. The, the pitch count – it doesn't seem to go. They're all sissies. As, as well, there's there's the truth from Chuck. They're all sissies. All right. Uh, if you guys want to know where he is, I'm just I'll I'm let, right here. I'll let you know. Look, I mean, Nolan Ryan said it. 
Mm -hmm. You know, these guys are baby. I mean, I mean, is it the average was what 186 to 190? No, no. Back in the day, you know, pitchers anywhere from 100, 125 to 150 was okay. Good. Okay. For a, for a pitcher who pitched along, but you know, there was nothing for a pitcher to go seven, eight innings. It, what what caused it to, to go down? I mean, I know you. They're said sissies. They're, oh, can, can you explain that as to how they just they're you know they I I don't know. Mm. All of a sudden, everybody kept counting pitches. Counting pitches became this thing instead of. Looking at your pitcher and going, is he tired? Mm -hmm. Does he mm -hmm. look tired? Is he losing velocity on his pitches? Yeah. Is he starting to miss his, you know, curveball or whatever pitch he throws off his off speeds? You know, yeah, yeah. Does he have his command? Yeah. Is this pitcher going to last? Yeah. And, and and here's the here's the question that I, I want to bring up. With a win like that, whether you're Boston or Atlanta or the Washington Nationals or anybody like that, Nationals win. You know, looking at a game to bring you five and five to bring you with you know at five hundred, how much momentum does that carry into the next game, or does it? I mean, depending on how hot you're going to be. The problem with baseball is there's 180 games, 162. <laughs> It's like I know he did. He did what I did. No, I just I was exaggerating. Okay. It's like it's like a game a day. It's a really a half season. year. <laughs> you know, it just seems like you're always playing baseball. Oh, oh my so god! So I don't think momentum until the end of the year really means a whole lot. Mm -hmm. You mm -hmm. know, I think they're just they. Most teams look to be 500 plus, right? Right. The first half, mm -hmm. and then catch fire the second half, right? So, so you're you're playing for I believe it's September is the no you're, no you're playing for before September. Well, to to get to get into the playoffs by what September November something like that. But October -ish is what you're looking. For. Yeah, it's October. All right. So the one more baseball comment here. I wanted to let you know, uh, Mike Trout actually uh, for the Angels left with a left pulled groin. He's on, 100 years old on Tuesday. But, I mean, the dude is hitting homers. He is. Hey, look, I've never said he weren't any good. I'm just saying he's old. Well, he's old and he's paid because that man got some money. I'm going to tell you that right he now. He can hit. Yeah, yeah. I actually, I I haven't really, I, I understand baseball a little bit better than I do now. I've been watching, I haven't really gotten into baseball much. But the last five years, I kind of got into Atlanta a little bit, trying to get around the league. To understand it, so it is an interesting game. I love the tight battles like that. I think that makes for a good game. And by the end of the game, you're trying not to fall over from an aneurysm because you want to. Take I really, I love it. Uh, and, and the thing about baseball is, mm -hmm. you don't have as much of an aneurysm like you do about football. Yeah, yeah. Because there's so many games that if they have a win loser here and there, you know, you're not. It's not going to kill you. Yeah. Speaking of an aneurysm in football, let me move to the aneurysm topic of the day, I think. I, I got to talk to you about this Josh Rosen thing because I'm, I'm confused on something. Uh, there's there's two things that I've heard from NFL Network and I actually read on uh, Redskins Wire. A lot of people are saying that, uh, and we did touch on this just a little bit last week, a lot of people are saying that, they're going, that Josh Rosen may end up at, at Washington and, and Keenum may go – to Arizona. Um, so if that happens – Well, the rumor is that they the Redskins signed Keenan for trade mm -hmm, for trade bait. Mm -hmm. We talked about that last right, week. Right. And we talked about it might be for Rosen. Right. Um, I think that – I don't know. Look, Rosen was horrible last year. Right. Now, was, was it, it what coaching? Right. Was it scheme? Mm -hmm. Was it skill? You know – May you know I didn't watch every Arizona game. Sure, I didn't sure. study his film, so I can't tell you if it's you know what it really is. Mm -hmm. So maybe the Redskins see something in those films and mm -hmm. that say that hey, you know he He's may be the next Kirk Cousins. Oh, well, <laughs> well, you like that, don't you? All right. So so and and here's the thing. Talking about uh, uh, Mike Mayock said it, and a, a couple others. Uh, uh, Mike Garofolo said this. Look. He hasn't had the talent to throw to, you know, with the, with the team that he has. Okay, around. hold on. Except, he has Larry Fitzgerald. Except for – I wasn't done yet. Except for Larry Fitzgerald. Now, 
again, how much of it is skill, just like you said. And he's got quite a few speedy receivers that tend to be open. You know, J.J. Nelson and a few others, mm -hmm. the uh, Brown, who, I mean, some of them are no longer there this year, but they were, they're not bad receivers. So, if, and if, mm -hmm. if you're a good quarterback, if you're a Tom Brady, it don't matter who your receivers are. You can have no receiver and they still catch a ball. I mean, when you've got a guy for the majority of your of his career was a third receiver in other teams, comes to the to in, in to the Patriots and is the number one receiver. Yeah. Automatically. I mean, nobody even knew who he was. There's been a few of those. Mm -hmm. I mean, some mm -hmm. there's been a couple of receivers come to the Patriots and had great season had great Careers mm -hmm. well after not being very good. And again, we mentioned this a lot. You know, when you when you <coughs> go to the Patriots and you're you're on the team because the coaching scheme works and everything around you works. There's the whole identity. But I just hate hearing there's no talent. Well, the, the, because if you are talented enough to make it in the NFL, then you have talent. And and, and I'll, I'll get to the Patriots in one second because there, there's a question there too. And, and this is why I wish the show was two hours because now it works. But but look, here, here's the thing. You know, if they if they sign Rosen, well, they wouldn't sign him. He's already signed. If they trade for Rosen, if they tra excuse me, if they trade for him, what are they? Are they going to just draft somebody to back him up? No. Well, maybe they might sign somebody to back him up. Okay. I mean, if that's if they wouldn't need to draft anybody if, mm -hmm. if that's who they're the way they're going. Right. If right. Rosen is going to be, they they see something in him that says that that's going to be our guy. We can make him a winner. Yeah. Then they'll bring him and they'll sign a couple guys to back him up. I, I mean, I, hopefully not McCoy. But, whew, no, I, I I think he's he, he's gonna sit there. Here's the problem: I can't trust anything the Redskins say because they believe in McCoy. I believe in Corduroy, but I don't wear them. But my point, yeah, you know, yeah. there there's something they you know they keep coming out and saying they haven't they keep signing McCoy because they see something in him that you know. He could be a starter, and he hasn't been yet. You yeah. know, and been sitting in the same spot for. So if they can, if they're going to keep doing that, I, I I don't trust that they have very good skill judgment. And, and again, that's that's Allen and Snyder and the whole. Yeah, I mean the whole so, organization now, has Rosen yes. may be great, mm -hmm. and he may turn out to be a great quarterback. But will it work in the scheme? And that's what you yeah. Yeah. You know, or maybe not. <laughs> yeah. Maybe another huge and, and it flops, and the year ends at, at, at 6 and 10. And again. Again, and there it is. Now, something to be cool about football real quick, I, I, I did read this story today on the XFL. A couple of really interesting rule changes. Let me just pull this up real quick. Got to, do we uh, honestly think the XFL is going to do anything? I, You know, that's a good question because, you know, with the, the, the total fold now of the AAF, uh, players being signed, from the AAF over back over to uh, the NFL. Here, well, then it's temporary. Now, now, they're all going to be cut again yeah. once the season. Yeah, these here, are, here they're the going first. from 75-man roster back down to 55, mm -hmm. or 100-man roster mm -hmm. back down to 55, mm -hmm. you know. And, and here's the thing. Looking at <laughs> looking at this, when this fold happened or the, the stop of operations happened, Players came back and their stuff was out in the hotel lobby. And there's a guy had to pay fifteen hundred dollars on his own credit card for his hotel room because they couldn't pay it. I, I'm like, woo wee. The, I hope the XFL is watching this. But as we said, Mr. McMahon does have deeper pockets. Yeah, he can. So. We can guarantee he'll at least pay for the first year. So I'm pretty sure they will stay in at a Holiday Inn Express last night. But I mean, you know, that's where we're gonna go. But just talking about some of the some of the rule changes, especially after a touchdown. There are three options now. That they, One, two, or three! They, and not a field goal. There we go. Have taken away the kick. And you go for a one from the two-yard line, a two from the five-yard line, or a three from the ten-yard line. Now, the difficulty in that is when you're inside the ten and it's boxed, it's a lot tougher yes. to, to, to get why they're giving three points. Mm -hmm. and, and and there it is. That is the, the new you know rule changes there. Yeah. They've... they've uh, they got, I think I, I honestly think the XFL will make it maybe a year, maybe two. Okay. Um, okay. They started off strong the last time, and then just died kind out. Kind of, kind of filled it out. Um, yeah. And I think because it was, a, it was extreme, was the only reason it lasted as long as it did. Mm -hmm. 
mm-hmm. you know, that no fair catch punt stuff. Well, and, and, um, and going on that, there's the, the five yard halo rule now where they, there is still no catch, no uh, fair catch. But the difference that they've done now is when they catch the ball, they have five yards to move before the player can initiate contact, which does involve, does uh, help with some safety, but not much. You know, that, you know, that's, the, I think people will watch to see how many people get hurt um, <laughs> or die. <laughs> but oh, I, I don't, man. I mean, I, I just want to watch for another he hate me. I like the name. I hope know. they don't do that again. <laughs> that was stupid. <laughs> you think, you, you think, know, having nicknames. I mean, they, they try to do some stuff the NFL wouldn't do. Mm-hmm. And, you know, if they do some good stuff, maybe. But I, yeah, I don't know. got to see what's going to happen. You know, it took years for the Canadian Football League to even be able to break even. Yeah, yeah. And, and again, that's – that's. I mean, to not even been, be able to finish out a season, that, that doesn't say a lot for the AAF. So, I yeah. mean, that's, that's tough. Two things I want to cover real quick because we've got uh, about 15 minutes left. I do want to touch on WrestleMania. Uh, Mania was very good. I think everything about it was incredibly decent. Uh, you know – Okay, the, hold on. Hold on. Let's Let's – Analyze what he just said. Okay, here's go ahead. I think WrestleMania was good. Everything was decent. Good and decent are not the same. I meant as far as the way it ran. It just the matches were <coughs> incredible. Uh, all of the matches were incredible. As a matter of fact, well, WrestleMania usually is. It's it's the Super Bowl and, of wrestling. And I honestly have to say, the one match that surprised me that I did not think would be good was Batista and Triple H. He tripped getting into the ring, which is – Batista tripped getting into the ring, which is the funniest thing I've seen, and he laughed about it, and the announcer laughed about it. But when they got going, that was a really good match. I I know you never liked Batista, but he weren't a bad wrestler. You know, he wasn't bad, but the thing that bothered me is I've seen injuries take a wrestler out, okay, to where – Batista got injured three different times, and it was the same injury each time. He had the elbow. He had the upper. Uh, well, that's not the same injury. No, I mean, but the same, you same know, arm. Same arm. Yeah, but it's different parts. Yeah. Your body is weak. You know, different parts get weakened. Um, yeah. You know, I, I never disliked Batista. I thought he was, you know, pretty decent. He he did very well. Not very good on the mic. And, and, no, the mic was very wet. He spit on that mic worse than I, I – I'm that's all Vader <laughs> used to spit more than I don't know. I, I you, you thought it was sweat and spit, sweat and spit. Yeah, and it was a lot of spit and a lot less by the end of the night. Uh, the, the the most surprising thing to me was the Becky Lynch and the uh, Becky Lynch, Charlotte, and Ronda Rousey. Ronda Rousey suffering a broken hand. Uh, let me just say this. Do not make Ronda Rousey mad because she punched Becky Lynch square in the face and she took one on the eye. There was a comment that she made. Charlotte was chopping uh, her, and she said, you chop like a, and there was a, and, and Charlotte went, oh, really? And she went to chop her. She missed, and uh, <laughs> Ronda overhead crossed and got her right square in the middle of the nose, and it was just, it was nasty, but. Ronda ended up losing. Uh, there was some controversy. We're not sure if both shoulders were down. They have not brought that up yet, but I think that's the next angle they're going to set up because now they've combined both titles. Becky has. Did, we, did I did I not predict all this? But we, you know, we both said that we thought that. Uh, that oh, so why do you always got to take my thunder? No, I I, I I brought it up. I said it. You would latch on and agree, and now it's our idea. Yeah, Chuck does everything. I do nothing. That's where he's When going. that comes into play, I said that. Roll the tape. Mm-hmm. Okay, roll the tape. Here we go. But, I mean, as far as, you know, Mania was done very well, so I enjoyed that. Uh, and a lot of things happened on uh, Raw last night and SmackDown as well. Uh, we'll cover some of those next week. I want to take this last couple of minutes that we've got. I've got a couple of questions that came in. We had a lot of questions. Uh, yeah. Oh, you mean oh, okay? Yeah, yeah. We got email. We can't. We can't cover those kind of questions <laughs> that you have, uh, <laughs> Miss Winnie. I know you're still with us, so we'll go ahead and get you in here too. Welcome everybody that has joined the Sports Radio Show and who's listening on uh, www.letgoradio. 
Uh, the first Don't forget to love me. Please, please love him. Please, please. He's had a tough day at work. I have. It's been rough since 4 in the morning. That's a long shift. All right, so the first question comes from Kaylee. And Kaylee asks, is it difficult with CP uh, in marriage to marry someone that also has a disability? Um, I, I'm going to answer this question with, with, a, with a two-part answer. Uh, number one, it depends on how severe uh, the other person's disability is. You learn to coexist because where some of the strengthnesses are, in, or, or vice versa, some of the weaknesses are in one person, uh, the other person can pick up their strengths. I mean, I think that, yes, it's hard to live with, with two people with, with disabilities, but you can make it work. I think it tends to find that it ends up being that way. You, well, you find that people with disabilities tend to tend to be together, not mm -hmm. because in your case, it's like, you know, I mean, you know, it's hard to find someone who's not disabled and they give you a chance. Right. And, and, and that's, that's true. I, I mean, that's, uh, Ms. Winnie, uh, let me, let me ask you on this. Do you think, uh, before I answer that next part, do you think that it's harder for a person uh, with a disability already to marry another person with a disability and do you think it's harder for them to work together or coexist? Um, I think Miss Winnie fell asleep. Uh, she she may have. I, 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 but I, I, that, I, I, I mean, you know, I think it depends on how y'all work together mm -hmm. and, you know, mm -hmm. what kind of disabilities it are, mm -hmm. you know, how, how what, what, you, what you can, each of you can do. You know, um, I mean, I, I've seen dis disabled couples who, you know, I'm here. do quite well together. Okay, we, we got Miss Winnie now. We woke her up. <laughs> sorry for taking from your dad. Oh, I, I'm so sorry. I didn't realize that. Miss oh, Miss Winnie, did, did you catch the question or you need me to ask it again? I did, yeah. If you can okay. Uh, the question I got is from Kaylee, and she said basically – uh, when is it more difficult when you you have a disability and you marry into go into a marriage of a person with another disability? Is, is it harder to work together, being that two people have disabilities and and you know vice versa? What do you, what do you think about that? I don't think it's a problem. I don't think it would be hard. I think it's up to the individuals. I don't believe that. Uh, individuals with disabilities would get together if they felt that it was a problem in dealing with each other, supporting each other, or being there for each other. Um, as many couples that I have seen, like yourself, DJ, mm -hmm. with your disability and your wife having a disability, mm -hmm. I mean, just watching y'all getting along well, supporting each other, being there for each other, getting around and everything. So I think it's per situation, but, you know, the person that's, you know, seeking the relationship they should know what they're looking for before they get into a relationship. I think that's <laughs> advice for all couples. Yeah, that's, that's good. <laughs> you, you, catch, you catch check on that one. That's advice for all couples there. That's, that's, a, that's a great point. Know what you're looking for, people. Uh, exa you know for. Exactly. Know, that's true. Whether, you're in a, whether you have a disability or not, have a, don't have a disability, you got to know what you're looking for and what's for you because everything is not for you. And that goes especially with the disabled community and not to want to be, you know, be in a uh, relationship so bad that you will settle. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I would hope that any individual that has a disability, you know, is really wanting that relationship, mm -hmm. not wanting too bad or anxious, you know, and just settle for anything. You know, just be careful what they see. Yeah, Curtis just said, I, I think it all de call, it depends on the situation, and that, that's kind of what Miss Winnie just covered, so that's a good point there, Curtis. Um, I, and the last question I got, and this was a, a great question because I've Can actually – Can I ask it? Um, I don't know if – no, no, yeah, you, no. no, no this is from Erica647, and she, she asked this. For a couple that is disabled or a person that is disabled that wants to adopt or have children but has trouble taking care of themselves, if they receive help, should they adopt a child if they receive help themselves, such as with uh, bed sheets and dishes and, and, and things 
of that nature. That's a hard one because no, it's not. In, in, in my opinion, I, and I say this honestly with a disability myself, if you cannot take care of yourself, I find it difficult that you would adopt a child or bring a child into the world if you're not able to provide for them and to care for them fully. That, that's, a, that's a tough, and it's also a tender situation because I understand that people want to have children and, and give them good homes. But you have to look at what are you truly doing for that child and are you giving them the, 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 the best? I'm going to say this in a generic form, whether it's disabled, whether it's financial, whether it's mental, anything. Mm -hmm. If you cannot take care of a child, provide everything the child needs, mm -hmm. both emotionally, mm -hmm. physically, and financially, you shouldn't have children. Okay. Okay. I, and it's not, a, it has nothing to do with disabled. If, if two disabled people can provide all three of those things for a child, then yes, have children. I, I, I agree. I do. I, I have to agree with that. Matter of fact, 100% because the child's worth is important and you have to make sure that they're provided for. Miss, Miss Winnie, same question on that. What, what do you think? Well, while we wait for her, she's back on the phone. Um, no. I feel like um, if a person has a disability and they're financially insecure or finan don't have the financial means, and they already seeking help. They need caregivers. They need 24-hour care. It's a bittersweet situation because I understand wanting to have a child and you can. But if you already have in care, you already need someone to come out. It's already hard enough for people to get an aid to already come to their house and stay there. That's it. That's it. People go through it so many times. So you would be putting yourself in a situation and the child in a situation, and you might not get that aid. You might yep. not get that nurse to come by to care for not only you, but your baby as well. So, I mean, it's, it's, it is a bittersweet um, situation, but I think that they should really not do it, to be honest with and, you. And I agree. I, I, I don't think that would be a good solution. Mm -hmm. I don't, and, I, I and not just disabled people. I mean, you know, anybody. Mm -hmm. I think if you can't provide the, the what a child needs financially, yeah. physically, yeah. and mentally, then you shouldn't be selfish and have a child. Because you because you got to look at this too, you know not only the aid situation but the transportation situation. You, yeah. you you've got to be able to get your child to the doctor, to the store, you know all of that. And and if I know people that have six kids that are on you know financial aid and they keep having them because they wanted a girl. Mm, yeah, yeah, and th and that's the wrong and reason. You know what? Yeah. They can't these these the, those six kids are going to either have to you know, be geniuses and win scholarships yeah. to having yeah. the chance to go to college. You're never going to be able to save for six kids unless you're rich. You know, college is expensive. That, yeah. You yeah. know? And so many people go into debt just trying to get their kids through exactly. college. And so, can you I mean, imagine that's... trying to do it for six kids? Yeah. yeah. You know, I think it's unfair to the child. I mean, I believe that we should have our children better than what we have. And, and that's a good way to get it because if they're better than what you had, they can provide then, for themselves and then go exactly. into the future with a, with a good head on their yeah. shoulders. I, I don't think we should have kids just because we want to have kids. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I agree. Listen, guys, anytime that you want to uh, come in on the Sports Minion Radio Show, please don't be afraid to call in and talk to us, 757-774-7552. You can always follow us. Uh, we have an email uh, the Sports Minion Radio Show at Yahoo.com. I'm us. always happy to hear how much you love me. And I tell you what, you, you may not like Chuck's answers, some of them, but I tell you what, he gives it to you like he sees it. And sometimes that's how this world has got to be. Sometimes the world is just too sugar coated and people don't want to look at it through rose colored glasses. And I'm can't. not candy coated. No, no. <laughs> oh, God. Can you, can you imagine some flavor in that? <laughs> <laughs> Baskin Robbins. Yeah. How many scoops? None. None All so bitter. <laughs> <laughs> None, please. Look, we hope you enjoyed this episode of the Sports Minion Radio Show, where Chuck and I, being to the day where they roll away in the Lord of the Lunatics, we deliver sports and many other things to our community the best way we can. We'll see you next Wednesday at 2 o'clock. If you can't be there, if you can't be good, be bad, but be good at it. This is DJ and Chuck saying see you when we see you. Goodbye, everybody. Love me! Baskin Robbins took flavor. Wow. <laughs>
<laughs> it, it might as well call it Atomic Warhead. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> wow. Oh, man. <laughs> They're probably talking right through the intro. Did you um? Did you see when I say shh? Yeah, I, I, yeah, I did. Yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> but.